The Tom Woods Show, episode 857. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. If you were educated in a public school, chances are you are a victim of educational malpractice and you don't know what to do about it. Well, I'll tell you what to do about it. Learn the history and economics they kept from you by joining my LibertyClassroom.com. And as a listener of this show, get a discount by checking out our secret coupon page, LibertyClassroom.com slash coupons. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here talking about the deep state today, getting to the bottom of what that is, because we're hearing a lot about the deep state being opposed to Donald Trump. Well, what does that mean exactly? And joining me to help sort this out for us is Phil Giraldi, who wrote an article some time ago that you should probably read called Deep State America. I'll link to it on the show notes page. Phil is a former counterterrorism specialist and military intelligence officer of the CIA. He is also executive director of the Council for the National Interest, which you can visit at councilforthenationalinterest.org. In his capacity as an intelligence officer, he served 18 years in Turkey, Italy, Germany, and Spain. And what do you know? He actually speaks Turkish, Italian, German, and Spanish. He also holds a Ph.D. in European history from the University of London. Phil, welcome back. Thank you. Great to be on again. I'm very curious about this whole matter of the deep state. It's kind of floated a little bit out of the news these days, but it's still in the background. And I, I wonder, as a, if, as a member of the intelligence community yourself in the past, if you might be able to explain to us what is meant by the term deep state or what ought to be meant by it, if there's anything to it, if there's anything sinister to it, or if this is just a, a whole lot of, of, of propagandistic and, and conspiratorial hype? Well, there, that, that's a whole bunch of questions. The, uh, uh, the deep state really is a, a concept that arose after the Second World War, and it applied to countries um, like Turkey, and in fact, specifically Turkey, because Turkey was perceived as having a, uh, a state within a state whereby most of the decision-making on major issues was conducted uh, not through the popular assembly or the prime minister's office, but rather through this uh, sort of murky sub-establishment that, uh, that uh, wielded the real power in the country. It, uh, in Turkey, it combined um, ex-members of the security services, police, politicians, businessmen in, in kind of a network. Um, so that's where it comes from. And, and the concept was that this was a system that was um, contrary to democratic norms, and uh, that was the danger of it. Um, the, the expression continues to be used in places like the United States. And I think sometimes it, it, it might be more um, understandable to the American public if we just refer to it in a different way. I mean, you could call it the establishment in a way because in the United States it operates much more in the open and the collaboration between Wall Street and uh, Washington is uh, is essentially how the deep state operates in the United States. All right. So then let's talk about the disturbing comments by, remember Chuck Schumer mm -hmm. basically warning Trump that in effect, he's playing with fire if you go up against the intelligence agencies. And he didn't elaborate on this, but I don't think he had to. What do you think that was all about? Well, I think that uh, that was an interesting comment. I think what it meant when he said it was that the intelligence agencies are very well wired into Washington and the media, and they have lots of ways to get back at you and against you if you say or do the wrong thing. So in a sense, he was saying, you know, watch out for the revenge uh, mode that the intelligence communities can engage in. But I think um, we have now seen in the case of, of uh, Michael Flynn uh, that this has gone to a whole new level. It looks to me at any rate as if the intelligence agencies or law enforcement, this might be an FBI issue, um, essentially engineered uh, his downfall, and they did so by leaking information 
that they had access to, to the media and to certain politicians. And this led to uh, all kinds of consequences. Now, this is when it becomes dangerous, where, where suddenly the, um, the deep state, if you want to call it that, the intelligence community is able to um, essentially overturn policies and, um, and political appointees that come in with a new administration. This is, uh, this is uh, something quite frightening. I've thought of that term deep state as, I guess, obviously including the intelligence agencies, but somehow going beyond that. I've thought of the deep state as being the reason that, with the exception of Trump, who actually has made some changes that I I wouldn't have expected from most politicians, for the most part, we get a lot of continuity between administrations. Between Bush and Obama, there was more continuity than you would expect. Between Clinton and Bush, there was more continuity than you would expect. There's got to be some reason that no matter who gets elected, by and large, the machine just continues on. And, And I've, in my not very deep analysis, just attributed this to the the deep state, that there's something running the show other than the guy I'm seeing on television. Am, am I being crazy to think that way? No, I think you're, you're, you're completely accurate. I think the, uh, as I say, if you think of this in terms of the establishment and how the establishment has certain operating principles and has certain ways of rewarding people inside and out of, outside the government to essentially play the game uh, by these rules, then I think that's where we're getting close to to what the deep state is. I, I think that the, uh, uh, what we see is, for example, that we have uh, policies that essentially go unchallenged. And I would um, cite, for example, uh, when is the last time the American public got to vote on the continuous wars we've been fighting for the last 15 years? Uh, when is the American public really given a say in terms of uh, uh, the financial community and how the financial community operates and and what impact it has on their daily lives or more recently uh, uh, the whole issue of health care there's there's there are never any serious debates on these issues there are there are tweaks in the system where it goes from one one kind of uh, position to another but essentially uh, there is a, an establishment force an establishment consensus which uh, which makes the decisions on these things why do you think the deep state or what I mean I, I get why the why, let's let's disaggregate this a bit. I get why the establishment didn't like Donald Trump. That's obvious enough. But the intelligence communities in particular, it can't just be, well, he's been bad mouthing them or criticizing them. He didn't start doing that until he already had the sense that they were after him. Now it could be that he had the intention of instituting a new foreign policy or something, but as I look at it, the only thing that's new is that it's more. It looks like it could be more bellicose and and uncomprehending than ever. And the people he's surrounding himself with certainly don't seem friendly to Russia. So everything we were we were warned about that he might pull back on the wars and that he might make friends with Russia. I'm not sure that's actually materializing anyway. So what the heck could they have against him? It, it can't just be that he's thought about cutting back the the budgets of these agencies. Could it really be that petty? Well, I don't think he's going to cut back on the budgets. I think he's made clear that he's going to have, a, as you put it, a bellicose policy, which will involve the intelligence community. Um, I, I think there are a couple of issues that seem to surface for me. Uh, I think the Russia issue is a real issue because the Russia issue entails a lot of other things like Syria, uh, Eastern Europe. I think there are there is a consensus, a broad consensus among the establishment, within the establishment, that any kind of rapprochement with Russia is undesirable. So I think there is a certain extent of Russia playing into this. Plus, if you're a Democrat, you very much want to have uh, the Russia conspiracy as an explanation to your own political base as to why you haven't succeeded in, in the recent election. So th- there is a there is a motive there. And I think when you, we talk about the intelligence community, it's important to, to uh, analyze what that means. The intelligence community is basically um, 20,000 people like me who essentially are in a, in a certain circumstance where they perform a, a job of a certain type and they do their jobs and they're loyal to whatever government is in place. But at the top of these organizations, you have people that are heavily politicized. And, and I would say if you're, you're saying where is the deep state or where is the establishment in the intelligence community, it's these guys at the top. And these guys 
uh, are the ones that were particularly miffed by Trump and his comment, comments. Plus, these guys lost their status and lost their, their future employment when Trump was elected. So they have, they have an agenda. And I think if we're looking for uh, specific players who have uh, something that they want to, uh, a message they want to send to the new president, uh, these would be the people. Who do you think could possibly have the access necessary to be leaking the contents of some of Trump's phone calls? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, this kind of information, um, as you might imagine, is extremely tightly held within the tel- intelligence community. Uh, if uh, there is a transcript, I'm sure there are transcripts of, of Flynn speaking with the Russian ambassador or, or with other government officials in other countries, uh, these transcripts probably uh, move around uh, where uh, whoever is receiving it has to sign for it, uh, has to put a time and a date on it, and, and whoever gets it next has to sign for it. These things are very, very, very tightly held. So it's a very limited group of people who would have had access to this kind of information at FBI, at NSA, at CIA, and it clearly was someone from within that circle uh, who made the decision to move ahead with this uh, this leak of information. Yeah, that is really amazing. I, I, I don't remember cases of this happening where the president's private calls to foreign leaders were having excerpts leaked. Is there a precedent for that? No, I don't think there is. And, and uh, I, I think we have to look at this for what it is, which is a, is a major breach of security. Um, I would only point out uh, from, from an intelligence officer's point of view, that um, revealing to the Russians that we were able to listen in on their phone calls uh, would mean that they will be taking security measures so that won't happen again in the future. And whether you like you know, that kind of practice or not, uh, the ability to uh, find out what the Russians are saying on the phone uh, will have vanished. So it had a, uh, it had a serious impact in terms of uh, monitoring Russian activity in the United States. Again, whether that's a good thing or bad, but nevertheless, it has a it has a real life impact. I want to read one paragraph from your article that I'm going to link to. This is episode 857, linking to it at tomwoods.com slash 857. It's your article, Deep State America, from a couple years ago. I want to just read this paragraph and get your comment. You say, what makes the deep state so successful? It wins no matter who is in power by creating bipartisan-supported money pits within the system, monetizing the completely unnecessary and hideously expensive global war on terror benefits the senior government officials, beltway industries, and financial services that feed off it. Because it is essential to keep the money flowing, the deep state persists in promoting policies that make no sense to include the unwinnable wars currently enjoying marquee status in Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan. The deep state knows that a fearful public will buy its product and does not even have to make much of an effort to sell it. That paragraph seems to hold up pretty well a couple years later. Yeah, it really does. I mean, you, there's always, uh, I don't know who coined the expression, follow the money, but whoever did, he was a genius. Uh, when you get right down to it, you know, the, the players in this, in this, whether again, you're going to call it deep state or just a, a kind of establishment, whatever you want to call it, they're, they're largely motivated by uh, personal profiling, uh, profiles and where they have uh, status in the government and they're motivated by money. And you, you see it every day, literally, when congressmen leave, they join a, a lobbying firm. Uh, the lobbying firm then turns around and legislates in favor of uh, the clients of the lobbying firm and the clients in turn dump money <laughs> on the former congressmen. So it's not just congressmen, it's military officers, it's senior intelligence officers. Everyone knows that to play in the system uh, and not bend the rules is highly beneficial. Let me shift gears for a minute because I know that you and I have very similar views on foreign policy. And I think you and I thought there was some modicum of a possibility that somebody with who's more independent and who's not part of the system might have some chance of changing the foreign policy. And especially given that he talks about the foolishness of of a couple of the previous wars, he even uses the forbidden term America first. But apparently America first means 
fighting wars in Syria and continuing to intervene in Yemen. That's not how I interpret the term America first. I think you'd have to twist yourself into a pretzel to make those things compatible. And this is why I I get criticized by a lot of Trump supporters who thought I was just a pointy head when I would say the problem with Trump is he has no intellectual curiosity. He's got no desire to form systematic views that are grounded in something or or to really read and become informed. He's just got a lot of impressions. Now, it's not to say he's not a smart guy, because at some level he is a smart guy. But the fact that he could simultaneously hold in his mind the foreign policy establishment has screwed up beyond belief, but I want to press forward with their overall strategy, that there's a, something's wrong there. So what, what have been your thoughts in watching his, un, his foreign policy and his foreign policy team unfold? Well, I, I, I share what, what you said. Uh, basically, he doesn't uh, seem to have what we would call a policy. He's, uh, he, he has a, a series of emotional and half-thought-out responses to specific situations, and, and this is dangerous. The, uh, uh, the whole idea that uh, Iran is eternally a bad guy and can't be a party to any constructive activity in the Middle East is foolish. And buying into buying completely into the Saudi and Israeli view of what Iran represents and what's going on in Syria is is equally dangerous. Um, I I suspect he will surprise us in terms of doing some some of some things that we would consider to be the right thing. Um, I really liked his his comment. When he was interviewed, uh, what the week before last, where he was questioned uh, by Bill O'Reilly about uh, uh, killing that uh, Putin was a killer, and his response was that you know uh, we're not exactly innocent in that regard too. That's that's a sensible response, uh, and I hope that and I pray that he will do the sensible thing by Russia, which is not necessarily to acquiesce. Uh, in terms of uh, Russian policies and things like that, but to find some comfortable middle ground where we can work with the Russians and the Russians would be willing to work with us. I think that's absolutely essential. I think it's the number one foreign policy issue. He might just do that. I think he's going to uh, uh, blunder around in the Middle East just uh, like his predecessors have. Uh, And uh, I hope at a certain point he'll realize that the military option is, is not a very good option at all and that he will have to do more in terms of diplomacy, in terms of, uh, um, I hate to call it coalition building, but at least relationship building with the various groups that are engaged in the Middle East. And I think, and I hope that he gradually will indeed um, minimize the U.S. role in the Middle East. Is there any appointment he's made anywhere in the foreign policy world that has pleased or not horrified you? Um, I think the Secretary of State is not a bad choice. Uh, I think um, our two generals are not bad choices either. Um, One has to, I think, differentiate between people who are talking as generals and saying things about enemies because the purpose of a general is to defeat adversaries and people who are now in a more serious position where they have to be thinking in terms of policy. They're both bright men and um, they have uh, shown some signs of being pragmatic. So I think uh, I'm, I'm not displeased by the, uh, the foreign policy team. Uh, I do note in today's paper they're talking about how the uh, State Department has been excluded from um, um, many of the foreign policy discussions that have taken place up to now. That's, um, that's somewhat of a bad sign. Um, but um, we shall see where it goes. You know, I don't doubt that there are many millions of people who really strongly dislike Donald Trump. And dislike way, way out of proportion to the proper level of of dislike that somebody might have. I mean, what, you know, they they think he's going to throw uh, you know homosexuals into, into detention camps or some bizarre ideas that obviously never in a million years would cross his mind. But having said that, there's a part of me that thinks there's something fishy about all the protests. So that there are so many of them, the numbers are so great. Do you think this is just a spontaneous outpouring of left-wing outrage, or do you think there's something more sinister at work? Well, I think this. I think one should describe these demonstrations as highly organized. Um, uh, there are groups that are clearly re- revealing money, uh, have received money uh, to to organize these events. Um, but you know, the, this this um, 
this hatred of Trump goes back quite a ways. It was it was evident during the campaign where uh, Trump was receiving nothing but negative coverage and his opponent was uh, was getting softballs thrown at her. Uh, so there 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 is again, this goes back to the deep state, doesn't it? I mean, this goes back to the establishment and what the establishment wanted to see in a candidate. And Hillary Clinton was a perfect candidate and Donald Trump was uh, was the antithesis of that. And um, so, yes, I think this stuff is being organized, it's being supported, and I agree with you absolutely. What do they expect Trump to do? He's not going to be uh, throwing people in the jail because they're the, they're the wrong uh, ethnic group or something like that. He doesn't have the power to do that, apart from anything else. I, th I think that uh, what we're seeing is um, a resurgence to a certain extent of the old left, which you and I probably remember from our younger days. And um, it's uh, definitely um, getting some support from outside. Uh, whether this has any long-term legs uh, can keep going, I kind of doubt. I think a lot of these issues will go away, but we have to assume that the media in particular uh, will continue to be very anti-Trump and that will fuel a lot of opposition to him. Now, we can't know what's going to happen in 2020. Let's say, let's just then for argument's sake, talk about 2024. There's nothing the deep state would like more than for the Republican Party to go back to nominating Mitt Romney, you know, whoever this, the Mitt Romney of the day turns out to be. Do you think Trump manages to have a long-term lasting effect on the direction of the Republican Party? Or do you think after Trump, it's back to Romney, McCain, Dole, as far as the eye can see? Uh, I fear that the Trump phenomenon is, is, uh, is time sensitive. It's going to... Uh uh, have some effect. There are going to be uh, some people that will be happy with his performance and many others that will not be. And uh, I fear that, again, if we get back to the concept of deep state and establishment politics, we will see that uh, the Republicans will opt for establishment politics. I, I, I don't think that, um, that Trumpism as a popular, a populist movement uh, necessarily has a long shelf life. Uh, and, and let's face it, in eight years, uh, there are a lot of political changes that are going inevitably going to take place. And that will influence how um, the electorate and the Republican Party sees itself at that time. Well, I guess this is all highly speculative anyway, but I'm kind of inclined in, in your direction. And, and certainly he would have to make a really deliberate effort to to get his people in the right places and to organize at the precinct level and and be involved in their local party. And he'd have to have manual training manuals. He'd have to have a real nationwide program in place to get his version of the of the party uh, to stick. And he doesn't seem to have any intention of doing that. And so if he doesn't do that, then I think it, it does go back to Mitt Romney. Yeah, I think so. I, th I think basically the uh, um the Republican Party uh, uh, is basically a um, uh, is run by an oligarchy, uh, just like the Democrats are. And and the fact is, this oligarchy uh, likes its um, its perks, it likes its its money, it likes its access to power, and so on and so forth. And they they see themselves playing a certain role. And I think this role is again, if we consider establishment, deep state, however you want to define it, uh, these are the people that uh, that essentially are the the driving force in this. And uh, they're going to go back to what they feel comfortable with. Well, that is, uh, I think that's a wrap for today, Phil. But I, I appreciate your answers and your help in sorting all this out. These are really bizarre times we're, we're living through. And, and I appreciate uh, your help in guiding us through it. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, that's it for today. If you don't yet have my brand new free ebook, you got to start asking yourself some serious questions. Why do I not have this thing? It's called Sane Space. Subtitle, Libertarian Dispatches from Bizarro America. You can grab it for free over at SaneSpaceBook.com. That's going to do it for today. If you've been enjoying the show, consider joining the elite as a supporting listener over at SupportingListeners.com. I'll see you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.